Good morning, everyone. What a beautiful February morning. 50-something degrees and sunny in northern Illinois in February, you can't ask for better than that. So, so enjoy it, because I don't know how long it'll last. <laughs> Somebody just said, so if this is the way February is going to be, what is March going to be like? So let's hope it's 60 degrees and just fine. Um, we shall see. It's good to have everybody here um, joining us um, in the worship service, and those of you at home, we're glad that you're joining us as well. We will start off with a few announcements. Later on today, we have confirmation and youth group for kids, um, so if you're, if there's, I don't think anybody here in the church service uh, with that, but um, they'll be coming later tonight, so just remember that. On Monday, we have the trustees at 6.30 p.m., and then on Tuesday, we have staff parish at 5.30, so if you're on either of those committees, if you'll please remember, those meetings are coming up. On Wednesday, the 22nd, there are a couple of things that are just a little different from normal. One, our choir practice is at 6 o'clock instead of 6.30 because um, we have to make room for the Ash Wednesday service. We start Lent this week, which is just amazing that we're already at that point. But Ash Wednesday is this Wednesday, and we will ha be having service here in the sanctuary at 7 o'clock, and we will have... Um, so the bells will be playing again at that service, and we'll also have the imposition of ashes on your forehead or on your, your um, wrist. So please feel welcome to come to that service as well, 7 o'clock. Um, then, let's see, then, then the next day I leave on vacation. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> Wait, I, I'm not sure how to take that when people clap that I'm going away, but okay. But no, it'll be nice to get just a little bit of a break before we head into the, the real rush of Lent. I know we will have started it, but there's a lot of things coming up then. So um, so Karen will be preaching um, next Sunday, so we're glad for that. The uh, choir will be singing, and Bill Wendell will be joining us to be able to give a presentation on the capital campaign that's coming up. So I hope that you'll, you'll be here um, next Sunday as well. One thing I forgot last night is I thanked people for the wonderful service that we had last night. We had 70 people here for the gospel sing, which was awesome. But I forgot to mention Jeannie and Julie for putting the PowerPoint together. It's a, something that they do every single week, very, very dedicated in doing that. So thank you, Julie, and thank you, Jeannie, for being able to do that for both of the services. We want to say thank you also to Jack and Janet Becker for the altar flowers, um, the red and white flowers. Uh, they always do this because it's their wedding anniversary on Valentine's Day. So they celebrated their 52nd anniversary this year, and that's why they are red and white. Change the World for February will be donated to the Revolution Workshop, which is a nonprofit group that is um, helping people who have had some troubles in life in the Chicago area be able to... Uh, um, learn how to weld and do things like that so that they'll have a good skill to be able to, to help um, the, the um, communities that they live in, especially in the Chicago area. So that is what um, our, our mission money will be going to in February. I will let Mert later on be able to tell you how we did on the Super Bowl. I'll give you a hint, it was really good. So. The new uh, name, address, and contact information directory will be coming out next Sunday. So if there are any changes, please let Marsha in the office know this week. We are continuing to uh, collect money for UMCOR with the earthquake relief in Turkey and Syria. And so if you, there are some envelopes on the table if you would like to put um, any money in that for them. Otherwise, just in, if you're writing a check, put UMCOR in the memo line and we'll make sure that it gets to the right spot. And this today and tomorrow are the last times for uh, going on Amazon Smile, if you ever want to, well, if ever in the next two days want to buy anything from Amazon and you go on Amazon Smile, a certain percentage of it comes back to our church. They are ending the program at midnight tomorrow night, so if you wanted to order anything on Amazon and give back to our church simply through that, you please do so in the next day. Our table, the next Our Table, is coming up on February 27th, 5 to 6 p.m., not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow. The Lenten study will be on Wednesday, March 1st at 5.30 p.m. If you'd like a book, please let me know, and I'll order one for you for $5. And the Prairie South Spring, Link, 
Spring Lay Academy is coming up March 11th and 18th. See Marsha if you have any interest in that. I think those are our announcements. So if you will please bow your heads with me for our focusing prayer. Ever surprising God, whose love leads us to new experiences, help us to be open to your appearance among us and within us. Let us sense your glory in the sights and sounds of this day, and may your Holy Spirit move us to speak of the light that you reveal to us all. It's through your Son, our Savior, we pray. Amen. And now, if you are able, please rise as we join Mert in our call to worship, our response to call to worship found on the screen. Climb to the mountaintop of your life where God reigns. Break through all that clouds your vision. We will look around us to see God, not only on the mountains, but in the valleys of life and in the love of others around us. Let yourselves be eyewitnesses of God's majesty. Enjoy the good earth the Lord has created for all of us. We will be attentive to the voice of Christ calling for us and follow him with our hearts and actions. And if you will, please stay standing as you're able um, for our opening hymn, number 173, Christ Whose Glory Fills the Skies. So today is a special day in the church, and I didn't mention its name beforehand, but do you have any idea why today is special in the church, Anna? Okay, exactly. I don't know. That's all right. It is a big word day. It is called Transfiguration Sunday. Can you say that one, Transfiguration? That's okay, don't worry about it. So on the, <laughs> on the day of transfiguration, that means to change, basically, okay? And on the day of transfiguration in the Bible, Jesus' face changed. It like became glowing, and his, his clothes were whiter than white, way whiter than my, my robe even, okay? Well, this coming Wednesday, we celebrate something as well. I mentioned that it's called Ash Wednesday, and we change our faces as well. 
Do you have any idea what would happen on Ash Wednesday? Do you think it has something to do with ashes? Yeah, okay, you're being quiet today, okay. Well, on Ash Wednesday, we, do you know what ashes are? Like after something burns up, the black charred stuff? Okay, what we do is we take those and we put them on our face. <laughs> do, you, do you want to do that on Wednesday? No, okay, well you don't have to, that's quite all right. Why do you think we do that? Do you have any idea why we put ashes on our, on our face? <laughs> well, that's okay. It is to signify that we're sorry, okay? Back in olden times, a long, long time ago, thousands of years ago, that's what they did to show that they were sorry, is that they would put ashes on, on their, on their um, faces and possibly other parts of their body, and they would actually wear really rough clothes because that showed that they were sorry and they wanted to, to make amends. They wanted to basically just say, I'm sorry. So here's what we do as a symbol. Guess what this is? Do you know what that is? A leaf. It's a leaf, but it's a special leaf. Do you remember, well, and it's okay if you don't, but last year on Palm Sunday, you did something with this. Do you remember what we do with palms? go crazy. <laughs> well, you do kind of wave them around like that, and they kind of go crazy like that. But that on Palm Sunday, these are really nice looking. They're really vibrant and green, and they're full, and we wave those around the Sunday before Easter. But I save those. If you don't take them home, I save them. And then this is what they look like almost a year later. Does it look cool? That's fine. So what we do then is I burn all of those and the ashes are what we put on our faces in the sign of a cross to say that we're sorry. You look scared. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. You don't have to do it. Don't worry about it. But we put that on, we mix them with oil, which is a sign of healing. So we have healing and repentance for the things that we did wrong during the past year. So that's what we do on Ash Wednesday. I know it sounds kind of strange, but it's a symbol that's been used for many, many, many years. Do you think those ashes that I put on the forehead are going to stay there forever? Will I, always, will I always have a black mark on my forehead? Do I, ha <laughs> do I have a black mark on my forehead right now? Okay, thank you. I thought I looked in the mirror today, but no, it's a symbol. We washed them off that night. But we do this to remind ourselves that God's love and forgiveness is always available. We always might have a black mark on us, but we always can wipe it off because God loves us, okay? So it's okay that you don't come on Ash Wednesday, but I wanted to let you know what happens on Ash Wednesday because we always need to remember that when we fall short of doing or saying what we should, that we can remember that we need God and God will forgive us. It's very good news indeed. Okay, do you want to take this? <laughs> okay, you don't have to. It doesn't look as good as the ones we'll give you on Palm Sunday, okay? Okay, well, I'm going to let you go back with your brother and your mother now, okay? And if you guys go up to Sunday school or nursery, you're welcome to do that, okay? Thanks so much, Hannah, very much. Bye, Henry. And now at this time, I will invite the Elm City Bells to be able to come forward, and they are going to be sharing with us our special music for this morning. It is entitled, Morning Has Broken.
Just very, very, a calm morning has broken, which is very nice, which is what you want. So thank you very much, Bells and, and Karen. We really appreciate it. And now I'll invite Mert to come forward, and she's going to give for us our mission moment. We haven't had one of these for a little bit, and she wanted to be able to share with us a few things of what is happening with the church in terms of our mission and ministry. Thank you, Ryan. Um, First of all, let's start out with um, what your mission team um, 
has been doing for you and uh, for charities around the world. Um, for those of you that might be new to our congregation, uh, Change the World is a focus that we have every month here at the church. Uh, we choose a charity. Uh, some of those may be um, global in nature. Um, examples of that would be UMCOR, the Heifer Project, uh, water.org, Feed My Starving Children. Also some more regional uh, charities such as the Redbird Mission, uh, Midwest Distribution uh, St. Mark's Freedom School and Living the Beatitudes, which used to be called the Rainbow Covenant. Um, some more local act, um, charities that we um, have focused, uh, PMA, uh, Buddy Bags, uh, the Food Pantry, and uh, Christmas for Kids. Um, over the last few years, we started this in the fall of 2016, um, and since then and up to now, we have um, focused on 31 different charities. Uh, we're pretty proud of that. Um, and with that, we have donated over $26,000. Now, that's not us. That's you. So I, I give it up for yourselves. I give yourselves a round of applause. That's pretty awesome. Um, in 2023, we decided to up the ante just a little bit. Um, your missions team is going to match dollar for dollar up to $500 for every charity that we focus for Change the World, plus the Super Bowl, which that money ended up being, with the match, um, $1,235. I'd give it up for you on that one, too. Yep, yep, pretty amazing. That money all went to the food pantry, by the way, too, and they're going to be able to do a lot of good work with that. Um, along with that, if you have a charity that you are passionate about, that you would like to see focused, um, please nominate that to either Ryan or myself, um, and we'll try to get that into the rotation. We do plan these out several months in advance, so if it doesn't happen right away, um, that's because we, we've already determined which, which charities we're going to focus for which months, for which months. Um, but it, see Ryan or myself, and we'll, we'll do what we can um, to get your charity um, uh, if, uh, on the Change the World rotation. Um, other financial supports that your mission team has um, provided emergency funds through PMA, uh, this is above and beyond change the world. And also here in our own church, the, the pastor has an emergency fund. Um, and we've provided opportunities there. Um, we also have had breakfasts in which we have donated money through UMCOR and also you know, uh, Hungry World Farms we've also focused and, and, and helped provide money for those. And I know by now you're saying, well, but what can I do? I know you're saying that to yourselves. <laughs> but, so as, as a church, um, your mission team is, is going to provide a couple of opportunities. Um, May 3rd, uh, we have our reservations to travel to Aurora. Um, we will be packaging meals for Feed My Starving Children. Um, we'll have a sign-up sheet a little closer to that date because um, I don't know if you're like me. I would sign up and then promptly forget about that. Uh, so that'll be a, a, um, a little closer to when we actually go. And also, uh, we would like to make an overnight trip south of Springfield to the Midwest Distribution Center. Um, and we'll have a sign up for that as well. Uh, that date is st yet still to be determined. Uh, what am I missing? Probably a bunch, because that's how I roll. <laughs> no, I think uh, but, uh, we are doing a lot of stuff, giving a lot of money, being able to actually, now that we're able to, do a number of things in person. So we're, we're, we're excited about the things that we're able to do, so. All right, well, thank you so much, folks. Yes, thank you. And just a reminder that 
$1,200 given to the food pantry is so much more than $1,200 because the food pantry can buy from the various distribution centers for 18 cents on the dollar. So it's like five times that amount. So we, as a church, basically gave about five dollars $6,000 toward hungry people in our community. So again, thank you very much. And now, Mert will um, read, lead us in the hearing of our first scripture lesson from Exodus. Okay, so this morning's uh, first reading is from Exodus 24, verses 12 through 18. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and wait there, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. So Moses set out with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God. To the elders he had said, wait here for us until we come to you again, for Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute may go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, He called to Moses out of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. Thank you, Mert. And if you are able, if you'd please stand as we hear our gospel lesson for today. Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. Six days later... Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up. And do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Fear. It is a part of every life. Some people seem to thrive on it. Others curl up in a ball when faced with it. And while I personally cannot understand the thrill, the horror genre of movies is big business. Horror films sold about $700 million in ticket sales last year and are one of the most profitable genres in the film business. When asked why people love these movies, it's rather interesting what the research shows. Those who enjoy horror tend to seek out stimulation, have a higher sensation-seeking trait, enjoy being open to new experiences, and tend to have lower levels of empathy. They really don't mind seeing other people be hurt. And the typical horror movie buff tends to be young, male, and have a healthy monetary income. For me, you would have to pay me money to go see one of these. I have nightmares way too easily, and I really do not enjoy being scared. So why would I put myself intentionally in a place where I will almost always jump out of my skin and have to pay money to boot? No, it is not for me. I have mentioned before that I have cholerophobia, a fear of clowns. And it's not just the evil ones. I don't like the friendly ones either. I think it's because they're covering up who they really are and are just not being genuine. Logically, I know why they do that. I don't have to like it, though. I much prefer it when people are open and honest, so that's why 
I say I don't enjoy clowns. And I have to admit, I had troubles last night. I woke up and had a little bit of a nightmare because mom stayed overnight and one of the programs we watched on TV ended up having an unexpected clown appearance. And let's just say I dreamed about that last night. So, <laughs> But all of us do have fears, whether it's a full-fledged phobia or just something that worries us. It's then a matter of what we do with them. Do we let them control us? Do we let worry about them consume us? Do we find ways to forget about them? I think God would say that the best thing to do is give it over to him and not be fearful. But is that easy? Not for many of us. In doing research for this sermon, it says that only about 9% of people admit to having a true phobia, an intense fear of just one thing. But an interesting poll from only one year ago found that 52% of American adults feel that they have danger or are in danger at least once a day. Over half of people feel afraid every single day. Now I have to admit that in this poll, it's younger Americans below the age of 35 who drive up this number. About 75% of young Americans feel afraid at least once a day. Of course, they have lived through times that have been consistently perilous, from the 9-11 attacks through the pandemic to school and work shootings. There just hasn't been much of a safe time for those who are younger. And those living in an urban area say that they are more fearful on a consistent basis than their rural neighbors. So while you yourself who are sitting in the pews or those of you at home might not worry too much about safety, there are a whole lot of people out there who do. And while it's nice to have eternal security in God's promise of heaven, it's also nice to have it here on earth as well. I do believe that we can turn over many of our worries to the Lord, as so much of the time they are actually unfounded. We do have to have trust that God is looking out for us, while still being safe and smart with the life that's been given to us. But sometimes, sometimes, it's God who puts the fear in us. An elderly woman had just returned to her home from a Sunday evening worship service and was startled to find an intruder in her house. Without a weapon, she simply yelled, Stop! Acts 2, 38, which says, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins may be forgiven. The burglar stopped dead in his tracks, and the woman calmly called the police and explained what happened. Shortly, several officers arrived and took the man into custody. As he was placing the handcuffs on the burglar, one of the officers asked, So why did you just stand there? All the lady did was mention Acts 2.38, a Bible verse. What? replied the burglar. I thought she had an axe and 2.38s. So I imagine he was about as scared as Peter, James, and John were on Transfiguration Day. I've said this before, but the Transfiguration event is a tough one to understand, mostly because I think he really had to be there to get it. For those who were part of Jesus' inner circle, this may have been easier to understand as the three disciples explained it. But for those of us so far removed from it, and being so used to superhero and fantasy movies, depicting in graphic detail scenes much more fanciful than this one, we kind of wonder why these three were so spellbound on the mountaintop. But think back to what they must have experienced and how unusual it would have been for Palestinian fishermen in the first century AD to have gone through this. Jesus hand-selects three disciples, likely his best friends, to go with him up the mountain, just the four of them. Here they are both treated, they are all treated to the official revelation that Jesus is God's son. You may remember that this announcement was made also at his baptism, but of course the disciples weren't there at that time. Jesus has been hinting or outright saying it for a good while now, that he is God's son. But as he's preparing for the final trek to Jerusalem, 
God makes it known to the inner circle. And he does it in pretty amazing fashion. Not only are Peter, James, and John treated to God's voice, but Moses and Elijah appear as well. These were two heroes of the Jewish faith, role models the disciples would have been excited to see. But remember, they had died years, hundreds of years earlier. It would have been like seeing ghosts of your favorite heroes. So as Peter, James, and John are experiencing Jesus in white, the voice of God, and two people who simply shouldn't exist, the Bible says they fell to the ground overcome by fear. I can understand. I probably would have fainted. But it sounds like immediately Jesus touches them and tells them to get up and not be afraid. And when they did that, Moses and Elijah had left, and there was nothing left to be scared of. While that's wonderful for Jesus to say, it's a lot harder to put into practice, just not being scared. It's a blessing to know that Jesus is with us in spirit, but at times we kind of rather have someone right there with us to protect us or assure that everything is going to turn out well. But often that's not going to happen. So let's see what Jesus shows us in the transfiguration that might help to let us handle fear a little better. As the disciples are bent over in fright, the first thing Jesus says is, get up. God knows that there is very little that can be done when we're frozen in fear. While it may be difficult to get moving when we're scared of something, if you're truly in danger, you usually try your best to get away from the situation. To remain where you are means you're a sitting duck. But I know this is hard. There are times when I've woken up in the middle of the night to a noise that I'm certain came from the kitchen or the living room. So what do I normally do? I bury down deeper under the covers. I stay really, really still, hoping first and foremost that the noise was just from a dream. But worst case scenario, if I'm really quiet, the burglar won't figure out which is the bedroom and just leave, because of course that's going to happen. Thankfully, nothing like that has actually happened to me in reality, but I really don't think hiding under the sheets is going to help me very much. It might be prudent to stay away from the intruder for a while, but eventually one of us will have to leave. And if you get up and look around, you just might find that there really isn't anything to be afraid of. Jesus' next instruction is to come down the mountain. Besides getting up, we have to move. To become paralyzed usually doesn't end up well. Looking at what you're supposed to do when you're afraid or attacked by something, it looks like pretty much only bears and gorillas are what you should run away from, or, or should stay paralyzed. Otherwise, you get away as fast as possible. To go back to my example, if I do get up and I found out someone was out there, I could actually then call for help or get out of the house. I think Jesus is right. Even when you're scared, you need to keep moving. And if you move forward, you might find that your fears aren't nearly as bad as what you expected. Much of the time, we tend to be scared of and worry about things that never actually happen. Only if you come down the mountain will you find out that what you were frightened of actually exists, or maybe it doesn't. That doesn't mean you shouldn't use caution. It doesn't mean that if you do move, everything is going to be fine. But I can tell you if you don't move, things won't change. Things won't get better. Jesus knew that his people couldn't stay where they were at. God was calling them to grow. That requires change from what currently is. So be willing to move even when you're frightened. The view may end up being so much brighter if you do. Jesus' next instructions to the disciples may not work perfectly in every situation, but I do think they could be prudent. He says to first be quiet about the situation. Nowadays, that's normally the last thing we do. 
We tend to tell everyone who will listen about our experiences. This may be our family, our friends on social media, or that poor unlucky person who gets trapped behind us at the grocery store line. We often want to hear, we want to have everyone hear about our troubles and how we might get through them. And psychologically, that makes sense. Many people need to speak their problems in order to process them. But I think what Jesus is getting at here is more of simply taking some time to sit with what you went through, examine the feelings and the results, and draw strength from simply spending time with the Lord. Some things don't make sense right away. Some things take time and prayer to get through. If we move right away to gossiping and hearing what everyone else has to say, we might not hear what God says about it. And it just might be that God has a great way to help you with what you're afraid of. The one who created us and the world just might know what it takes to help us through what we're scared of in this life. At times, we need to just be still and hear what the Creator and Savior guides us to. And it might be worth being silent for a while. But, with that being said, even Jesus admitted there is a time to shout it all out. He only asked his friends to not speak about what they experienced for a short while. They would know when the right time had come to talk about it. And when it arrived, they were to shout out the news that God had helped them through not only the frightening experience on the mountaintop, but even more, when they thought they had lost the light of their world. For I have found that even when I think the worst has happened, it most of the time could always be worse. Sometimes it happens to me, sometimes I hear about things happening to others, and I can't imagine how frightened they must be to face a certain demon or push through a time of life that they never imagined or wanted, or to simply keep going without a loved one by their side. But you know, there are so many who have gotten through those frightening situations. And they've realized how God was right there with them the whole time. If we can shake free from fear with the Lord's help, then we really do have something to shout about when the time is right, and that might just help others. The author Noah ben wrote a book about a character named Jacob the Baker who wrote down pithy life sayings while he waited for his bread to bake. One day when traveling, Jacob meets an old woman on the road and asks for her help in navigating this unfamiliar territory. She questions why he would ask an old woman for help, fearing she has no assistance to give him. And Jacob responds with this, Fear makes us not only less than what we might be, but less than what we think we are. Faith. Faith reminds us we should doubt our fears. Let me repeat that. Faith reminds us that we should doubt our fears. Fear is not going to go away simply because we wish it away, or we get up and face it, or we talk about it, or we ignore it. Every human has something that he or she fears. But what God tells us is that we can deal with our fears, even turning them into something life-changing, like the transfiguration, if we trust the Lord to be with us, as we face them. Let us be willing to face our fears when we need to, always remembering that God wants to help us through them. And that goes for whether you have a mountaintop experience, you hear a strange noise in the middle of the night, or for some unknown reason, you see a clown on TV. Amen. And now we are going to sing a hymn that I learned as a child. Um, It's called Kumbaya, and it is from actually an African um, dialect, and it means come by here. So how many of you know this song? Okay, pretty much everybody. So we're going to be singing four verses of it, but whenever you sing Kumbaya, know that that is meaning that you're asking God to come by here.
And now we lift up our joys and our concerns for this week. So we, I got a call from Sharon Borg this week, and she got good results from some tests that she was having. So, so we are grateful for that and, and wish Sharon luck in continued recovery. Again, we lift up Jack and Janet's um, 52nd wedding anniversary and continue to keep them in our prayers. Um, Jack's just kind of doesn't have a lot of energy right now, but he's moving forward on things. And Janet, we're glad that, that you're here and pray that everything works together to, to help you feel better as well. We are definitely happy that Becky Geither is doing so well. She's moving back home tomorrow, which is wonderful. She's been at Liberty Village for a long time, um, and hopefully she is feeling a lot better and will be able to recover, continue recovering well at home. We lift up Charlotte Turnier. She is back at Aperion after a three-day stay in the hospital this week. We continue to pray for Tom Kniss, Dan's dad. Um, he's doing much better after breaking several bones last week. I know that's where the, the Knisses are today, helping him out. Linda Breedlove also is very, very grateful. After spending eight months in nursing homes, she is coming home on Wednesday. So she is very excited about that. So continue to keep Linda in your prayers. Esther Tracy had successful cataract surgery this week, so we are very grateful for that. We pray for all of those who are also ill and getting test results here in the near future, as well as those who are traveling. We lift up Pat Etheridge's great-grandson, Bodie. He was taken to the hospital this week, so we pray for him. Judy Harris's brother, Charles, had emergency surgery this week. Do you have any report on how he's doing? He's still in intensive, he's still in intensive care, so we continue to lift up Charles. Thank you. We also lift up the um, situation with the um, earthquake in Syria and Turkey. I, you know, last week when we talked about it, I think only about 7,000 people had passed. Now it's over 45,000. So they need so much help and, and prayers. We also lift up that Ted Johnson had his birthday this past week, and so we, we celebrate with you, Ted, as well as any others that are, are having um, birthdays this week. It's wonderful to have um, Lee Walgren in church with us today, so Lee, we're very glad that you, you came today. Um, and also, I wanted to give an update, Beth... Um, Beth um, uh, Beth Mulcahy texted me this morning that um, Monica, the lady who we had um, give the special music, give part of the special music last night. We were praying for her because her mother was getting, Georgia was getting ready to go back to be with God. And we found out that at 11.15 last night, um, Georgia went, went to be with God. So um, Monica gives prayers and asks for prayers and gives thanks to the congregation for, for hoping to pray her mom back to be with God. Those are the ones that I have for this week. And if you will, um, we are going to bow our heads for the pastoral prayer, but it's going to be a little different today. I'm going to invite Mert to come up, and we're going to do a responsive um, um, pastoral prayer. I will be speaking, and then, then Mert will respond. And at the end, we'll invite you together then to join in our um, Lord's Prayer. So if you'll please bow your heads with me for this prayer. Oh God, we thank you for your gift of light but above all for the light of your glory that shines in the face of your Son. You said long ago, let there be light, and there was light. You saw the light, and it was good. You chose for yourself a people, and through Moses you gave them the law. That their path might be lighted by its wisdom and truth. And when they preferred to walk in darkness, in the deceptive comfort of darkness. You sent them prophets like Elijah to rebuke them, recall them, Save them. Gracious God, we thank you for moments of special illumination granted to whomever you single out for revelation. We thank you for allowing Moses a vision of yourself that made his face shine like the sun. We thank you for letting faithful Elisha witness the homebound Elijah in that chariot of fire. Confirming him as Elijah's successor, fit to wear the prof great prophet's mantle. Sovereign God, creator, Author of light, we marvel at your graciousness. You allowed your servant John to baptize your son and to participate in the pleasure you took in him. You permitted blundering Peter and squabbling James and John to accompany our Lord to that mountaintop. And to witness his transfiguration, awed, dazed, but unharmed. Like Moses or Elijah or Peter, powerful spirits, 
yet mortal humans. We long to experience his light, to be transformed in his likeness. Help us to recall that in your divine wisdom, you grant such moments of ecstasy only rarely. And that even saints like Peter, James, and John may not remain on the mountaintop with the Lord. Let us also remember and hear the concerns of our brothers and sisters and help them. Just as you hear and help every person who calls upon you in need of help. Lord, make us thankful for Moses on Sinai, for Elijah's faithfulness, and for the witness to your son's glory shared with us by Peter, James, and John. But let us not forget that our mission is not to sun ourselves in your light high above this earth. Confirm us, rather, in our earthly, earthly, earthy mission on this conflicted planet. Our mission to preach the good news of your reconciling love, to do justice, to show mercy. And, and to, to walk, walk humbly with, with you by the light of your glory, shining in the face of your Son, in whose name we pray the prayer he taught us to pray together, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you very much. And now, uh, if you'll please um, indulge me, a big thank you for all those who give um, up to our church in so many ways. For, for giving of your time, your talents, and your gifts. And for those of you in the sanctuary today, you're welcome to give any offerings to the church in the plates that are located at the exits of the sanctuary. Um, for those of you who are at home, you're welcome to mail them in, put them in the locked white box outside of the main doors, or to give through PayPal. And we appreciate every, every gift that is given to us. If you'll please bow your heads with me for the offering prayer, and then as you're able, we'll stand and sing our doxology. O oh God, who has given us visions of what you want us to accomplish, help us to use the resources we dedicate here to accomplish the work you call us to. With joy, we bring this money to be dedicated to your use and to help others in need. Amen.
have the benediction, I do want to say thank you to everybody who helped out, especially the, the Bells for their wonderful music today, for Mert doing a little bit extra today as well. And Josh is off and about um, work, doing some other work things, and so Ben and David were doing the, the live stream and the tech work today, and so we, we definitely appreciate that. So please remember that we are heading into Lent, um, and if you're giving up anything or adding something, remember you have until Tuesday to do whatever you need to do on that. <laughs> so what basically that means is that I will be eating a lot of chocolate on um, Tuesday, let's just say that. So, But please remember that Lent starts on Wednesday, and if you would like, we would love to have you here at 7 o'clock for the Ash Wednesday service as we remember and bring in this special time of year. And now if you'll please hear the benediction. Yes, there are fears in this life. Um, it's part of being a human. But God gives us the opportunity to make it through those difficulties and to be able to thrive with his blessing. Face those fears and be able to help others with how you get through them. Go in the peace, love, and joy of our Lord. Amen.